If you or your church interested in a live presentation of Hell's Bells, we can come to your church or community and over two evenings hold a dynamic outreach. One of our ministers will provide live narration with a specially edited 16mm film combined with slides. They will also be available for personal ministry and answering questions. In the past, we have seen great outpourings of God's Spirit as thousands of young people and adults have made commitments to Christ. Over 300 churches nationwide have opened their doors to this ministry. Here is what a few of the pastors have said. This seminar was the most informative and moving experience that our church has had relating to the dangers involved for our young people in the world of music. At the end of the two-day seminar, the altars were filled with adults and young people seeking the Lord. Dwight Reigert, pastor of New Hope Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Georgia. Informative, enlightening, and challenging. Your seminar brought a cleansing to our lives. Approximately 200 people flooded the altar that night. Dan Qualls, pastor of the First Assembly of God, Rockford, Illinois. It proved to be one of the most informative events that our youth and adults have ever experienced together. When the invitation was given, over 50 responded. John Loper, pastor of the Gary Wood Assembly of God in Hueytown, Alabama. If you would like information on how you can bring Hell's Bells live to your location, please write or call us. Ask for David Dalton, Director of Ministries, Real to Real, Post Office Box 4145, Gainesville, Florida, 32613. Or call area code 904-371-2466. Continuing with our examination of the byproducts of rock and roll, consider one of its greatest themes, rebellion. Then there's that spark. There's that rebellious spark, which is what rock is. For Blackie Lawless of Wasp, it goes even deeper. As he told the Washington Post, rock and roll is an aggressive art form, pure hostility and aggression. I believe in that like a religion. The spiritual significance here is brought out in this Old Testament passage. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Biblically, witchcraft is synonymous with Satanism, and rebellion is its root. For I stand forth to challenge the wisdom of the world, to interrogate the laws of man and God. He who saith, Thou shalt to me, is my mortal foe. The rebellion spoken of here is not the honest and vital revolt of good against evil and truth against lies, but rebellion steeped in evil, anarchistic, hypocritical, and ultimately destructive. It's not an exaggeration to say that rebellion is more than just an occasional theme in rock. It is very heart and soul. As Rolling Stone magazine proudly noted in its 20th anniversary television special, And that's what rock and roll ought to be. The kids ought to come up and just hit you right in the face. I don't mean breaking noses, but I mean with what it is they have to say and dressing print so that adults are going, oh. God, yeah, that's it, you know. Make them throw up. Yeah. Now when I walk the streets, kings and queens step aside. Every woman I meet, they all stay spied. I want to tell you, pretty baby, what I see make my own. And I'm here to tell you, honey, that I'm bad to the bone. Bad to the bone. Rock and rebellion have become so intertwined, in fact, that even the rock industry's voluntary attempts at towing the line of human decency are fundamentally flawed. 
Take, for example, the many component parts that together made up Live Aid, rock shot at world hunger. When you bought this video, you saved another good few thousand. And talking of this video, it probably is the best compilation that I've ever seen. And it starts off with a brilliant band, with their even more brilliant song, Relax. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Are we to believe that celebrating the joys of sex and sadomasochism is really going to help the world? Can we build with our left hand what our right hand seeks to destroy? Practically speaking, several journals, including Rock's own Spin magazine, have reported that most of the aid ended up in the hands of Ethiopia's dictator and that few starving people were ultimately saved. But stop and consider the bigger picture. Which is really the better solution to the world's problems? Rock and roll or Jesus, the rock of age? A one-time donation to see Mick Jagger strip the skirt off Tina Turner? Or a generation who has stripped away the devil's lies and pretensions and are willing to dedicate their lives to the service of God in a hurting world? A crumb brush from the lap of a multi-billion dollar industry? Or an army of young people who are forever giving to others the money and energy they once spent on the rock and roll lifestyle? Just as a dead tree cannot produce good fruit, so an industry rooted in rebellion against God and His Word can never bring forth that which is truly good. As Jesus Himself said, that which natural man does is of no real use. It is only the Spirit who can give life. My words to you are Spirit and life. Like an invisible cancer that inevitably leads to death, so the satanic seed in rock and roll has culminated in a blatant obsession with the occult. Cryptic allusions to the devil and the music of blues artist Robert Johnson a generation ago have given place to an open worship of Satan and hell that comes complete with the symbols, liturgies, rituals, and messianic personalities that attend any religious order. No longer the stuff of small underground cults, millions of young people have been caught in its evil sway. Continuing with Dio's invocation. Then a little white sheep looked down at me. Said, heaven is where you ought to be. He said, come with me, because I know this is what you do. And I said, go away, I'll stay away with you, you, you. Beginning with the symbols associated with Hanuk religion, there is none more foundational than the pentagram, the five-sided star that is central to occult ritual. Next to the desecrated cross, there is also other symbol more common to the rock music industry. Motley Crue, Slayer, Bebop Deluxe, Metal Fatigue, Venom, Ebony Records, Sam Kennison, Suicidal Tendencies, The Plasmatics, Blackie Lawless's original group Sister, and ACDC are just a few examples where the satanic symbol is used. Another symbol that is integral to satanic religion is the El Cronado, a hand gesture that represents the devil himself. Like the pentagram, 
It too is virtually everywhere in rock music. Ozzy Osbourne, Meatloaf, Rick James, Cheap Trick, Motley Crue, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Coven, The Beatles, Kiss, Todd Rundgren, and Dio are just a few examples where this sign for Satan is used. On the back of his Spanish Train album, Christy Berg has this amazing artwork. Not only is the devil shown giving his own sign, there is a sense of both co-equality and reconciliation between him and the Lord Jesus, an incredibly blasphemous concept. It is with the fans, however, where the El Cronado finds its greatest expression. No doubt the vast majority have little or no idea what they are communicating when they flash this sign. But this is true with most supernatural things. Being both invisible and transcendent, spiritual forces can exert great influence over a person without their being aware of it, especially when they have a whatever-feels-good-do-it attitude towards life. And that's why looking at our actions or our fruit is so important. They give us insight into the spiritual roots within us. Anyone who is given to using the devil's sign has good reason to, in the words of Jesus, wonder what spirit is at work in them. Our next satanic symbol, 666, is taken from the Bible. Revelation chapter 13 assigns that number to the beast, the Antichrist forces who war against God. The number of the beast also serves as the title for this album by Iron Maiden. Aphrodite's Child, featuring the popular composer Vangelis, is even more to the point with this album's name. Along with the song we just heard by Anvil, RF7 and Coven also have songs with 666 in the title. The number of the beast appears on album covers by Black Sabbath and the Plasmatics. The stub set of Motley Crue and is etched into the vinyl of the best-selling album Licensed to Ill by the Beastie Boys. Most rock fans will recognize this hieroglyphic, commonly pronounced Sozo, as the unofficial name for Led Zeppelin's untitled fourth album and the personal symbol for Zeppelin's founder, Jimmy Page. What most people don't know is that by Page's own admission, Sozo is a stylized 666. Not since Nero's Rome has the mark of the beast found such widespread expression. In addition to symbols, Occult ritual and philosophy also abound in contemporary rock music. Beginning with the most well-known, many groups within heavy metal genre have popularized blatant, no-holds-barred Satanism and witchcraft in their music, album covers, and stage shows. Take, for example, the song Beyond the Gates by the group Possessed. There are thousands of songs just like this being performed by hundreds of heavy metal bands around the world. Most are seldom heard outside of small cult followings. A few have made it into the big time. Whether directly or indirectly, however, this type of music and the spiritual forces that attend it have made their mark on contemporary culture. What was once unthinkable is now not only sung about and considered, it is at times even embraced and acted upon. Heavy metal does not have a monopoly on blasphemy, however. The 80s have seen the emergence of a macabre brand of rock that combines elements of punk, new wave, and even classical music, including artists like The Cure, Bajas, Christian Death, 
Sisters of Mercy, Diamanda Gallus, Nick Cave, the Lords of the New Church, and the Smiths. The occult elements within this new genre are even more disturbing than those in heavy metal because they are combined with an intelligence and public passion rarely found in the latter. For example, when Peter Murphy of Bajas, in an admitted takeoff of a satanic mass, chants both forward and backwards the Latin for Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there's a certain feel, a sinister urgency you can cut with a knife. <laughs> As Propaganda Magazine described the recording of this song, Peter summoned his last reserves for the final push. As if suddenly possessed by demons, the whole foul-smelling mess spouted from his mouth like so much vomit. Later, the lingering evil spirits literally chased them right out of the dark studio, causing them to glance over their shoulders and laugh nervously as they spilled out into the suit. Diamanda Gallus whose voice was used to suggest the sounds of demonic possession in the movie The Serpent and the Rainbow, closes out her litanies of Satan with these words, To thee, O Satan, glory be and praise. Grant that my soul, one day, beneath the tree of knowledge, may rest near thee. The press kit for her Divine Punishment album noted that a woman committed suicide after listening to it. The entire performance is an eerie recitation of Old Testament scripture, with one exception. Gallus's Sono la Antichristo, I am the Antichrist. or consider England's Thrill Kill cult. You want danger, huh? I'll show you what danger is, baby. What are you talking about? Gateway to hell. What are you talking about? Gateway to hell. Amidst the 666, a crucified demon, and a desecrated cross, Thrill Kill Cult invokes the sights and sounds of hell with a tangible urgency and a chilling effect. Like other artists within this genre, and unlike the jackbooted flagrancy of heavy metal, the message is married to the most dangerous catalyst for satanic insurrection, a sense of religious and poetic transcendence. In this, the devil may lose an occasional human sacrifice, but he gains something that from his perspective is of much greater value. A multitude who is willing to sacrifice hope in life's meaning and faith in God's love. And this is what the devil does. What is even more remarkable about music is that while most of the groups readily acknowledge and even embrace its open spirituality, most do so with the insistence that it is ultimately Christian in its orientation. This is very significant. Because scripture makes it clear that the purest manifestation of the Antichrist spirit always comes, not from without, but from within the context of Christianity. Without going into too much detail, Satan's efforts in this regard have historically focused on propagating derivatives of an ancient and recurring heresy known as Gnosticism. And it is this heresy that has found new expression in the work of these and many other rock artists. In this regard, the words of Jude's epistle are as relevant today as they were centuries ago. These and their dreamings defile their own bodies, reject authority, and revile the angelic host, things they do not even understand. It's really no surprise that the Antichrist spirit has become so manifest in rock. There is abundant evidence that rock and roll's lifeblood has in some part been drawn from a musical form whose sole purpose is to summon forth evil spirits, voodoo. An ancient and highly developed form of ritual magic and animism, voodoo originated in Africa and was brought to the Americas centuries ago via the slave trade. There it gradually evolved into jazz, rhythm and blues, and finally rock. That by itself does not make these musical forms necessarily demonic. But rock and roll has dabbled in and at times even embraced the essence of voodoo in a manner unique among other contemporary musical styles. 
Fleetwood Mac, for example, incorporated not only the rhythms into their live performance of their hit song, World Turning, they included voodoo ceremonial dress as well. Haitian voodoo was also used on the Stones album, Goat's Head Soup. The icons, art, and ritual body and face painting associated with the voodoo religion show up in the videos of Pretty Poison and Peter Gabriel. Voodoo is the theme of this song by Colin James and makes up the name of this popular new wave group. Jimi Hendrix's interest in spiritism produced not only the song Voodoo Child, but the following observation from one Quasi Sid Sornu, a conga player who often played with Hendrix. Quasi was from a village in Ghana, West Africa, where his father was a voodoo priest. One of the first things Quasi asked Jimmy was where he got that voodoo rhythm from. That many of the signature rhythms Jimmy played on guitar were very often the same rhythms that Quasi's father played in voodoo ceremonies. The way Jimmy danced to the rhythms of his playing reminded him of the ceremony dances to the rhythms his father played to Oxen, the god of thunder and lightning. The ceremony is called Voodoo Shi. Whether intentional or not, Hendrix's Voodoo Shi must have worked its demonic magic. Two of his close associates, Alan Douglas, row manager and producer, and Thane Pridgen. Really was obsessed, you know, with something really evil, you know. Like Hendrix, David Byrne of the Talking Heads is also fascinated with voodoo related rhythms and has incorporated them into his music, most notably his collaboration with Brian Eno, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, an album that includes a song about demonic possession, the Jezebel spirit. Byrne's admiration of African-based rhythms and religions prompted his Alive from Off Center documentary on the Candomblé religion, a demonic hybrid of the Yorubu voodoo cult and Roman Catholicism. When the people of Candomblé make nuke or dance, they're talking to the spirits that guide them. In an interview concerning the documentary, Byrne noted, if you go back in the history of American popular music, you're constantly finding hidden elements of Yoruba influence. The rhythms are there, the sensibility in the lyrics is there too. A close relation to voodoo is the ancient cult of Pan. Half human and half goat, Pan remains one of the most enduring and compelling symbols for the Antichrist. Instead of God incarnate in man, as with Jesus, we see man joined to animal, one that is both a universal symbol for Satan as well as historically representative of the basis of animal and sexual passions. In the rites of Pan, like voodoo, music and frequently drugs are used to entice spirits to possess the ritual's participants. It's worth noting that possession by Pan, from which we get the word panic, often results in an obsession with sex and a need for immediate gratification. Not only do we see the sociological manifestations of this antichrist spirit everywhere in rock today, Significantly, we find some very direct allusions to Pan himself. Rush's 2112 album features the song, The Temples of Syrinx, a Greek word that relates to Pan. In 1987, Elton John commissioned an artist to design a family crest. Pan was the centerpiece of the design. The Stones album, Tattoo You, features this feminized representation of the demon's leg and arguably the most famous rock and roll song of all time, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, makes a clear reference to not only the music of Pan and his pipes, but his ability to spiritually influence and guide those who fall under his spell. Lyricist and singer Robert Plant begins with the thought that, quote, the piper will lead us to reason, end quote, and then sings. Your head is humming, I don't want to go, I guess you don't know. The Piper is calling you to join you. An interesting side note. In the remote mountains of Morocco, there's a group that still practices, in a very literal sense, the rites of Pan. The master musicians of Jajuka, as they are called, inhabit a mystical world where music is the key that unlocks the supernatural. As rock artist and writer Robert Palmer described in his article on them for Rolling Stone magazine, when the music and energy were at their height, the tribesmen milled in ecstatic trances. Their eyes rolled back in their heads, screaming like a great rending of the heavens. 
Japan himself was there. Several times I witnessed the instant when the current began to surge in earnest and course through the quivering frame of a local shepherd. When the power came down, the shepherd suddenly wasn't there and someone else was looking out of eyes that abruptly began to glow like ruby lasers. One night he came and jerked me out of the crowd and I ran with him. He leapt through a bonfire and then I was in the bonfire, surrounded by flames but unharmed. Then I was spinning like a top, spinning into darkness. We have seen you through the music, they, the pan worshippers, told me. Now you are one of us. Palmer is not the only one to become, quote, one of them. Rock has uniquely bridged the gulf, both geographical and cultural, that separates the Jajukan cult from the rest of the world. Among its other disciples are David Bowie, Robert Plant, and Patti Smith. The Rolling Stones founder, Brian Jones, spent considerable time in Jajuka, recording and then later releasing an album of their music. The Stones' 1989 release, Steel Wheels, features samples of this Moroccan form of voodoo. Finally, it is perhaps no coincidence that on Patti Smith's most Jajukan-influenced album, Radio Ethiopia, she writes in her liner notes what could double as the bottom line for either Pan or Satan in their musical war for the hearts and minds of men. Rock and roll is royal warfare. The universe is our battleground. The Fender, all guitars, are weapons. The technicians, great soldiers. The people, tender barbarians. The goal, the freedom to possess the key of 5th Battalion and release the fierce and stampeding angels of Abaddon. To a great measure, Smith's prophecy has come true. All around us, evidence abounds that the fierce and stampeding angels of hell have been released. True to the satanic form, Jesus is ignored or made fun of. The Christian standard of morality has been gutted until even the majority of young people who profess faith in Christ believe in and practice premarital sex. And the new idols of this age, our entertainers, embrace the satanic while multitudes scream in adulation. The early stones, for example, bankrolled an occult sect called the Process and provided a base of operations for their satanic evangelism. Later, Anita Pallenberg, aspiring actress and accomplished witch, became the companion of First Jagger and then Keith Richards. In July of 1979 at Richards' Connecticut estate, an 18-year-old boy shot himself while lying in Pallenberg's bed. Investigating officers uncovered reports of weird rituals and sacrificed animals that led up to the suicide. The Stones were further involved with occult filmmaker and Satanist Kenneth Onger. Jagger scored Onger's film, Invocation of My Demon Brother, and Pallenberg sponsored Lucifer Rising, a movie that showed, quote, the actual ceremonies to make Lucifer rise, end quote. Not coincidentally, the film starred rock singer Marianne Faithful, another ex-girlfriend of Mick Jagger. The occult has also played a major part in the life and music of heavy metal supergroup Led Zeppelin. In 1974, they founded their own record company, Swan Song. Its first British release was the pretty thing, Silk Torpedo. According to Zeppelin chronicler Stephen Davis, the album was launched at a blasphemous Halloween party at the Chislehurst Caves. Naked women lined the recesses of the caves and reclined before altars in the style of the Black Mass. Strippers dressed as nuns doffed their black habits. Though shocking, this type of behavior should come as no surprise when we consider that the group's founder is one of the leading occultists of the rock generation. Jimmy Page's fascination with black magic is so intense, he owns and operates the Equinox, one of the largest occult bookstores in England. And his devotion to this man is nothing short of religious. Aleister Crowley was one of the most infamous Satanists of our modern age. During the first half of this century, he developed a system of magic that combined the elements of a rock idol's dream, sex, drugs, ritual, and special knowledge that granted the practitioner a measure of power. Billed as the wickedest man in the world, Crowley claimed the title the Great Beast 666. When Kenneth Onger, himself a Crowley enthusiast, 
approached Page about writing the music for Lucifer Rising. He found in Stephen Davis's words a priceless collection of Crowley artifacts, books, first editions, manuscripts, hats, canes, paintings, even the robes in which Crowley had conducted rituals. Most incredible of all, Page purchased Bolskeen, Crowley's old home along the shores of the famous Loch Ness in Scotland. Later, Page had the demonic power associated with the house accentuated by having it redecorated by Charles Pierce, a renowned Satanist. Within the next few years, one of Bolskeen's caretakers committed suicide. Another went insane. Crowley's enchantment extends well beyond Led Zeppelin. Graham Bond, a rock pioneer whose bands provided the first break for some of rock's biggest artists, actually thought he was Crowley's illegitimate son. One of his later bands was entitled Alistair Crowley's Holy Magic, producing music that would, in his words, help the listener contact the higher forces. For Bond, it must have worked. He became mentally ill and later died amidst mysterious circumstances. David Bowie's 1971 album, Hunky Dory, featured Quicksand, a song about Crowley's cult that included the line, quote, immersed in Crowley's uniform of imagery, end quote. By 1975, biographer Henry Edwards described Bowie as having done just that, as he became obsessed with Crowleyan rituals and mantras, stored his urine in the refrigerator a la the beast's advice, and finally looked to witches and exorcism rites to deliver him from the evil spirits he felt controlled his life. The Stiff Kittens feature Crowley on an album cover, as did the Beatles on what was to become, many critics believe, the most significant album in rock music history, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. A glance at John Lennon's bookshelves reveals that Crowley's inclusion was not a token gesture. From numerology to magic, Lennon was fascinated with the occult. On the back of this album, Jim Morrison and the Doors are huddled around a miniature bust of Crowley. This fascination with the occult began early for Morrison. He attributed much of the direction of his life to an incident that occurred when he was very young. Traveling with his family, they came upon an accident that had left several American Indians dead, scattered along the highway. Morrison describes what happened next. The souls of the ghosts of those dead Indians, maybe one or two of them, were just running around, freaking out, and just leaped into my soul. And they're still there. Possession by these ghosts or spirits led to a life and art obsessed with death, occult imagery, and the rejection of God. Cancel my subscription to the resurrection. Send my credentials to the house of detention. In 1970, Morrison married a witch in a ritual that involved satanic invocations and the drinking of blood. A year later, the self-professed shaman or witch doctor of rock and roll was dead. Ozzy Osbourne sings a song entitled Mr. Crowley. Celtic Frost dedicates her album to Megatherium, the great magician, a name Crowley took to himself. And Daryl Hall also admits to a fascination for the infamous Satanist. As he told Penthouse Magazine in 1987, around 1974, I graduated into the occult and spent a solid six or seven years immersed in the Kabbalah and the Chaldean, Celtic, and Druidic traditions. I also became fascinated with Aleister Crowley, the 19th century magician who shared these beliefs. Three British rock groups also bear mentioning here. Psychic TV is the musical voice for the Temple of Psychic Youth an occult sect with ties to Crowley and practically every other Satanist of note. For example, the following dedication was made at the beginning of one live album, the 11th in a series of 23. We'd like to dedicate this concert to Alex Sanders, who died today, the full moon of Beltane, who was known as the King of the Witches, and who was the man who made witchcraft and magic legal in Britain after a long struggle. So we'd like you to remember that. But the war goes on! Yeah! 
Coyle also puts forth a cult philosophy rooted in Crowleyana. This album embraces two themes near to the great beast's heart, homosexuality and the worship of Pan. Probably the most devout Crowley cult of all is Current 93. The album and song Crowley Mass ridicules Christ and his birthday and suggests an alternative, October 12th. Their Here Comes Antichrist album contains bizarre and ritualistic music that defies any explanation other than that they are quite serious about their Satanism. Etched into the vinyl is both the Latin and the English for, He comes, soon you shall see. Crowley's heritage also lives on in the practice of necromancy, communication with the spirits of the dead. Iron Maiden's mascot, Eddie, is purportedly a lost soul who was brought back to life by the band's music. And at least two groups were actually given their names by demon spirits. Playing with the occult tool commonly known as a Ouija board, a device that incredibly many view as a harmless game. Four young men in an Iowa hotel room watched as the board spelled out, cheap trick. The rest, as they say, is history. And Vincent Fernier became Alice Cooper in exactly the same way. Songs like I Love the Dead and Cold Ethel, which include references to necrophilia or sex with corpses, suggest that the spirit's influence extend well beyond just providing the name for Alice's group. Finally, and perhaps most curious of all, Crowley, like many sorcerers, express an interest in backwards phenomena. For example, in his most famous work, Magic in Theory and Practice, he encourages his disciple to train himself to think backwards by external means, as set forth here following. Let him learn to write backwards. Let him learn to walk backwards. Let him constantly watch, if convenient, films and listen to records reversed. Confirmation that backwards phenomena is characteristic of satanic religion comes from respected British criminologist Henry Rhodes. In a book detailing the spiritual roots of modern crime, he describes the ritual surrounding a satanic mass. The priest so times his mass that it shall end on the stroke of midnight. His server is a woman with whom he should have been intimate. Prayers are said backwards. In fact, Backward phenomena is quite common throughout the occult world and in the lives of those who have been affected by its power. Had they known this, the police officers who discovered the backward writing in Tommy Sullivan's personal notebook would not have been surprised. Earlier in this presentation, we noted within rock and roll two examples of backward recording, commonly known as back masking. Each has been of the same variety where the artist or the engineer has simply reversed a vocal track and then mixed it in with the rest of the music. Now, it's easy to pick out this type of back masking when listening to a record forwards, which is still, presumably, the preferred method of enjoying music. The back mask section makes virtually no sense forwards and also has a distinctive atonal sound. Now, as another example of this type of back masking, listen to the beginning of In League with Satan, from Venom's album, Welcome to Hell. First, we'll listen to it forwards. no sense, does it? Well, when we reverse it, we hear... Biblically, theologically, this back mass message is really quite accurate. That is precisely what Satan has planned for each one of us. It's only through Jesus, who defeated the devil by his death and resurrection, that we can escape this fate. But back to the point at hand. 
It's evident that Venom had this back masking done intentionally. And therefore, it could be argued that there is no significance here beyond the fact that three guys like to get weird, probably just as a gimmick to sell records. But now consider the second type of back masking. With this variety, the vocal track makes sense both ways. When you listen to the music forwards, you hear one message. When you listen to it reversed, however, you hear something entirely different. Now, it's been suggested by some that when we listen to music in its normal forwards mode, the subconscious mind is able to decipher the backwards message and mind control results. It becomes what is termed a subliminal cue. Really, there isn't a shred of reputable evidence anywhere supporting that hypothesis. And anyway, so what if there is some subliminal suggestion going on here? As we've already seen, you don't need back masking to pollute someone's mind and heart. The regular frontwards music is more than enough to take care of that. The real question we need to ask here is not, can a listener subconsciously hear a back mask message? But instead, how did it get there? There are three possible explanations. Number one, that it's intentional. That like the first type of back masking, the artists or engineers are intentionally hiding messages in the music. We must remember here, however, that the vocal track makes sense forwards as well as backwards. For it to be intentional, the vocalist would have to sing just the right lyrics and in just the right way. And nobody's that smart, as a number of musicians and producers have testified. Number two, that it's just an accident, a quirk of musical fate. Well, not only are the mathematical probabilities of this absurd, but the fact that virtually every example of this type of backmasking conveys a message that is intrinsically demonic even further disproves this hypothesis. Really, the only workable explanation is our third choice, that it's spiritual, that outside intelligent forces with supernatural power are occasionally able to play an artist much like we would play a musical instrument. Biblically, this makes perfect sense as we see the principle found in 2 Timothy echoed again and again, that virtually all unsaved people have been deceived and ensnared by Satan and are captives to his will. The degree of captivity is determined by the extent to which an individual gives themselves to sin and embraces the principles of Satan's kingdom. Rebellion, slavery to lust, occultism, all the things we've seen so clearly manifest within rock and roll. In addition, Let's remember that many of these artists, an incredible number in fact, have quite candidly admitted that they and their music are influenced by some outside spiritual force. Like the subtle, practically invisible fingerprints left behind at the scene of a crime, the following aural phenomena point clearly to the one who came to steal, kill, and destroy. Our first example is from Electric Light Orchestra's El Dorado album. Here's a segment from the title song, Played Forwards. I sail away on a voyage I've now returned to see If the turn of life is meant to be Note that even forwards, there's an element of anti-Christian thought here. Eternal life is definitely meant to be. We're all going to live forever. The only question is where. Now, here's that same segment played backwards. Again. One more time. Our next example is by Queen from their song, Another One Bites the Dust, one of the most popular and enduring songs in rock history. Taking the same section and playing it backwards, we hear... Understanding what we learned in part three, 
that drugs and sorcery are closely tied together. It's easy to see the satanic motivation behind the command, start to smoke marijuana. Next, we have a song taken from Cheap Trick's popular album, Dream Police. The significance of the song's title, Gunna Raise Hell, becomes even more apparent when we reverse this segment. Again. One more time. Theologically, this is quite interesting because keys are symbolic of authority, particularly over the power of sin and its penalty, death and hell. Revelation 1.18 states that Jesus, who actually died in our place and went to hell, is now the living one, who is dead and is now alive forever and ever, and holds the keys of death and of hell. Satan's claim to hold the keys in this song, as well as on this album covered by the group Halloween, is very significant, not only because it's a lie and typical of his empty bravado, but because it points out how desperately he wants to retain ownership of people's lives. There's also theological significance in our next example, the live version of the song Anthem by the group Rush. When we play this section reversed, we hear... Again. One more time. One of the translations for Lucifer, a Latin title commonly associated with Satan, is the Shining One. And earlier in part one, we looked at a scripture that tells us that disguising himself as an angel of light is what the devil is all about. Our last example is taken from Led Zeppelin's classic, Stairway to Heaven. Yes, there are two fires you can go by, but in the long run, there is still time to change the road you're on. Once again, there's enough poison in the song forwards to prove fatal. Yes, it's true that there are two paths you can go by. Jesus himself said that there are two paths. One is a road traveled by the multitudes, where the herd instinct prevails, and where the desires of our flesh and the idols of the age lead the way. This path, Jesus said, leads to destruction. Then there's a road less traveled, a narrow path, that takes us to a hill outside of Jerusalem and to a cross. And this is the way, God says, that leads to eternal life. The fatal lie in this lyric is that there's always time to change the road you're on. No doubt the man who played the drums in that song thought that until he found himself choking in his own vomit. And by then it was too late. Each of us have no guarantee that our next breath won't be our last. And after death, the scriptures tell us, comes judgment. But there's not always time to change in another, even more fundamental sense. In John's gospel, Jesus said, no one can come to me, in other words, be saved from sin and hell, unless the Father who sent me draws him. What this means is that the idea to get right with God, to turn from your sin and embrace Jesus, isn't something you can work up on your own. For it to work, for it to be truly sincere, God has to draw you to reveal both your sin and the hope that is in Christ. Only then can you respond in a way that will change your life. If you reject that opportunity, you are in fact rejecting God and the chance to change the road you're on, a chance that you may never have again. That's why Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. And Paul declared, Today is the day of salvation. 
What day were they speaking of? Well, whichever day God chooses to deal with you. Now, let's get very real with ourselves and with God. If right now you're sitting there, aware of the sin that has enslaved you, and with a stirring in your heart that somehow you need to do something about it, then this is almost certainly your day. Maybe you're frightened, nervous, or uptight. That's all right. God can take care of that. But you have to give Him the chance. Don't blow off what is the most precious gift that you'll ever be offered the gift of God's forgiveness, His love, and His life. Back to Stairway to Heaven, here's that same section, reversed. Again. One more time. As we have seen throughout this presentation, Satan is not sweet. He's a liar and the father of all lies, and will use anything including one of the most powerful tools of all, music, to blind you to the reality of God's love and your desperate need for His saving power, to pervert your mind and heart and bring you into greater captivity to sin. His path truly is sad, but His power can be broken. For behold, he who was dead is now alive and holds the keys of death and hell. Stay sensitive to God and don't go away. In the next and final section, we'll share with you how your life can be changed and you can find the freedom and love that is in Jesus Christ. As we now approach the moment of truth, there are two common excuses that begin to roll around in people's minds, kind of last-ditch stabs at self-justification. One deals with the issue of intention and motivation. Hey, it's not my fault some of the groups I listen to sing about bad things. I mean, hey, I'm only in it for a good time, you know, blow off a little steam. <laughs> I'm not worried going out worse than the devil. Come on, That's for sure. It's a gimmick, man. That's all it is. It's just a gimmick. We'll come back to this issue in a moment when we look at the bottom line of Satanism and what it really means to follow the devil. But first, let's deal with the other excuse, one that is particularly common with religious people, those who, in the words of Scripture, love feeling good more than they love God, holding to a form of religion but denying the power of it. Ironically, it's people in this group who are often the most resistant to the saving power of God. Well, I don't like the satanic stuff, you know. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, 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 oh, yeah. I like the easy stuff, the noodle stuff, like like Whitney Houston or George Michael Denim. or Phil Collins. George I like the, the easy stuff like that. <laughs> First off, as we have seen, many of the artists who are considered neutral are not neutral at all when you look beneath the surface. Take, for example, one of the reigning queens of pop music, Whitney Houston. I don't know why I like it. I just do. 
though probably one of the nicest individuals within the contemporary music scene, as an artist there is no question that she has endorsed or at least permitted a worldly brand of sex and sensuality to be used to sell her music. While nowhere near as brazen as Madonna, aren't poses like this, or videos like Saving All My Love For You, a blatant celebration of adultery, just another more subtle side of the same coin. And even more importantly, isn't the so-called neutral stuff, by the very reason of its subtlety, potentially more destructive than the overt wickedness found in hardcore rock and roll? Surprised? Well, stop and consider the following fact of life. For something to be true, it has to be completely true. Inject into it even the smallest falsehood, and that truth immediately becomes a lie, a weapon in the hands of the one whom the scriptures call the father of all lies. And while there is no doubt that Satan's greatest triumph in this arena is to see people swallow lies devoid of even the slightest trace of virtue, cons like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the fact is that his most effective deceptions are those that carry a degree of truth. And that's why the middle of the road, in music as well as in many other areas of life, can sometimes be the most dangerous place of all. By way of an analogy, take strychnine, one of the most powerful poisons in the world. In its raw state, it's unattractive and extraordinarily bitter. Left in a room with young children, it's unlikely that they would pay much attention to it, and even more unlikely that they could stand to eat enough for it to be fatal. So it is with some of the more extreme forms of rock, music that directly glorifies death and Satan. Most people avoid it, although it must be noted that our society has become so desensitized and perverted that some are only too happy to take Satan's bitter poison straight. To the point at hand, however, if you were to take the same poison and sugarcoat it and add pretty colors to it and make it look, for example, like M&Ms and then leave it with the children, Virtually every one of them will eat the poison without hesitation. If you were the devil, which method would you find the most reliable? The bitter poison or the sugar-coated candy? As the great philosopher and writer C.S. Lewis noted in his classic The Screwtape Letters, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones without signposts. Using another analogy, the biblical picture of man without God is much like this poor fellow right here. He's in critical condition, suffering from a sinful, wicked heart that has separated him from God, spiritually dead and unable to do even the least thing to help himself. When his heart stops beating, he'll be launched into an eternity without hope. This person is in desperate need of help. Extreme forms of music, like heavy metal, glorify this fallen state. Perversion, despair, death, hell, Satan, and all the other horrors associated with sin are rubbed into the face of the listener. Incredibly, some subject themselves to this. Many others, however, opt for the safer stuff and head for the so-called neutral or pop music. But what does the pop musician really have to offer his listener? Cries of love, peace, and we are the world don't mean much to a dying man. In fact, by ignoring his condition or offering instead a false hope of salvation, this poor wretch's situation has only been made worse. Of course, there's nothing wrong with singing about love, unless it's the conditional and selfish love popularized by contemporary music. 
There's nothing wrong with singing about peace and caring for the world. These are all virtues taught and practiced by Jesus. There's nothing wrong with even singing about death and despair, as long as it is done within the framework of truth and God's redemptive purposes. Understand that God is reality. His Word is truth. And His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is salvation from sin. Heavy metal mocks this. Pop music ignores it. Which is ultimately worse? As we saw in part one, the primary reason for our existence is to know and experience God. An act called worship. Understanding only too well fallen man's tendency to lose sight of eternal things and reduce reality to a headlong quest for emotional and physical satisfaction. God cautions us throughout the scriptures to seek first His kingdom and not let the world system wear us down. Above everything else, guard your heart. In other words, what you listen to, watch, and do. For it is the source of life. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the left or the right. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Hundreds of years later, Jesus amplified this teaching when he said that our eyes should be single, completely focused on God. If they're not, your whole body will be full of darkness. No one can serve two masters. You'll end up loving one and hating the other. The bottom line for us is that if we really love God, we'll find ourselves naturally offended by things that mock His character, ignore His love, or pervert His truth. If instead we gravitate to and embrace these types of things, we don't really love God. We simply can't. If anyone loves the fallen world's ways, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything that is in the world, the desires of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boastings about what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now let's get back to the other key excuse that people use to avoid the truth, the issue of intention and motivation. Interestingly enough, Rock's fans aren't the only ones who live behind a wall of denial in this area. The artists themselves often like to play dumb. Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page denied any evil motivations behind his legendary involvement in the occult when he said, I do not worship the devil, but magic does intrigue me. Stone's guitarist Keith Richards told an interviewer, there are black magicians who think we're acting as unknown agents of Lucifer. In other words, if something is going on outside our control, it's not our fault. All-American boy Michael Jackson, whose phenomenally popular video thriller is filled with occult imagery, including his transformation into a werewolf and necromancy, or contact with the dead, begins the video with the following disclaimer. Due to my strong personal convictions, I wish to stress that this film in no way endorses a belief in the occult. And both Ozzy Osbourne and Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister try to downplay the obvious elements of rebellion and the occult in their music by claiming that it's all in fun and then professing to actually be closet Christians. What do these denials mean? If all these people mean well or are just trying to have a good time, they and their fans can't be considered followers of Satan, can they? Well, listen carefully because everything we've seen and heard so far has been leading up to what I'm about to say. Part of the reason that many people have such a hard time with this Satan worship business is because they have a caricature of the devil and his religion in their minds. He's the horn-headed dude in the red pajamas. And following him, should he even exist, means sacrificing babies, drinking blood, or something else equally horrible or weird. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. As we've already seen, Satan is an invisible spirit and a master of disguise. His ability to pass himself off as an angel of light can fool the rebellious or the spiritually ignorant into thinking that black is white, truth a lie, 
and even that God himself is the one telling them these things. And as for following the devil, many who openly do so can tell you that, at least for them, it's nothing like the movies portray it. And that's what's so frightening. For example, Anton LaVey, the high priest of one satanic church, explains the essence of Satanism as follows. Uh, you must, uh, as a Satanist, knowing this, realizing what his human potential is, eventually, and here is one of the essential points of Satanism, attain his own Godhead in accordance with his own potential. Therefore, each man, each woman, is a god or gods in Satanism. So, in essence, Satanism is simply each person acknowledging no one else, not even Satan, as a higher authority. As our own god or goddess, each of us is free to do as we please. Theologically, this philosophy is reduced to a single axiom found in the fourth chapter of the book of Satan. Say unto thine own heart, I am mine own redeemer. We are all born with the sense that we are not complete, that something is missing. The rest of life becomes a quest for wholeness and fulfillment, in theological terms, redemption. Whatever we look to for this, be it God, money, power, sex, or anything else, that person or thing becomes our Redeemer, by definition our God. Satanism states that that God is us. In a nutshell, Christianity declares that each of us bear the stain of sin and are therefore completely unable to save ourselves. We need a Messiah, a supernatural Redeemer. Every other religion in the world says, in one way or another, that we are not really that bad and that through our own efforts we can redeem ourselves. In this, they share the bottom line of Satanism and much of rock and roll. A pleasant number one hit song becomes a startling presentation of satanic philosophy when viewed in the light of truth. The religious imagery of Jacob's Ladder, Fallen Angels, and Running from Salvation make it clear, step by step, rung by rung, we are our own redeemers. Van Halen also denies a need for God's saving power in their hit song, Best of Both Worlds. Contrary to Sammy Hager's advice, Jesus said that if we are to have heaven, on earth or anywhere else, we must be born again. Another way this philosophy is expressed in satanic theology is in Aleister Crowley's most famous and enduring proverb, Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Before we examine the implications of this law, it's quite extraordinary how it, like much of Crowley's life and philosophy, 
has taken hold in the world of rock and roll. Led Zeppelin had Do It Thou Wilt inscribed into the vinyl on the initial pressing of their third album. Pharmacological guru of the rock and roll generation, Timothy Leary, for whom John Lennon wrote the song Come Together, had this to say in one television interview. Well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said uh, um, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, find your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. One of those glories involved rock musician Bobby Bosilil. He took Jimmy Page's place composing the music for Kenneth Onger's film, Lucifer Rising, and also took Do What Thou Wilt very seriously. Ultimately, it led him to Charles Manson and participation in one of history's most gruesome serial murders. Crowley's legacy had reached its full potential. But that potential lives on, in a more subtle way, in the lives of countless millions who have been made spiritually blind by the God of this age. This blinding deception has been focused on obscuring one of life's most elementary truths, that ultimately there are two kingdoms and two types of people. Those in God's kingdom, who have been redeemed by God, and those in Satan's, who are trying to redeem themselves. In the same way that the kingdom of God holds to one supreme commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So Satanism can also be reduced to one essential law, do what thou wilt. Contrary to the deceptive stereotype, no black masses or wild sex rituals are necessary to be a follower of Satan. Simply deny the love and the authority of God by living your life the way you want to. You can even be religious, attend church regularly, tithe, perform good works. If it's a religion based upon your own terms, you are still comfortably fulfilling the dictates of Satan's most primary law, do what thou wilt. How ironic that men like Crowley and LaVey should understand better than most people who attend church the true root of sin and the essential duality that divides asunder the whole of mankind. Each of us is ultimately given a choice upon which hangs the weight of eternity. We can go our own way and remain forever lost, or we can reach out to the one who is the way, the truth, and the light. To use an analogy, if what we believe is the music and what we do is the dance, we can, in the words of Billy Idol, dance with ourselves, remaining dead in our sins, following the ways of this world and its ruler, Satan, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and its thoughts, being by nature children of wrath. Or we can turn our ears to heaven's music and allow God to teach us a new dance, a new way of living our lives. All creation moves in a cosmic dance before the Lord her King And the rhythms, the reason, the rhyme of the dance pulses within everything and the universe wheels and whirls like a dervish in perfect seven-step time. The Lord made the dance, He taught her the steps, He causes the songs to shine. We must dance, 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 dance in God's honor. We must yield all our steps unto the King. We must dance, 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 dance in God's honor. Let His praises ring throughout the earth. danced into the world singing his heavenly song and he taught the dance to those who would listen 
and learn as he moved along. But the steps of his dance they led to a cross where he died while the haters mocked on. But he danced through death songs and over hell's gate, and in three days danced forth from his tomb. As we come to the close of this presentation, our subject has been swallowed up by the greater issue of man's rebellion and God's efforts to save him from that rebellion. Throughout Hell's Bells, we've looked at the symptoms of the spiritual anarchy, the mockery of God, the advocacy of sin, the embrace of the occult. But these things remain just symptoms. The real problem here is ultimately not what the singer sings about, what the guitarist does in his spare time, or what you listen to. These things inevitably flow out of the heart, and the condition of our heart is determined by the condition of our heart's master. Who rules your life? Who is your redeemer? Jesus said that out of natural man's heart, or the center of his being, flows evil thoughts, violence, immorality, and lies. The very things we seem to be at the center of rock and roll. God's solution for this heart problem is not a new diet and exercise. In other words, for us to work harder at being good, we can never be good enough. His solution is to give us a new heart, one that belongs to Him. And so God the Son became flesh and on the cross made the most marvelous exchange. He took our sins, our hearts, unto Himself, even going so far as to experience the penalty for those sins death and hell. In exchange, He offers us His heart, His life, pure, holy, beating with the life of God and the power of eternity. It's there for the taking, if you'll but make that exchange, giving up your old life and receiving the new. Rags for riches, death for life. Let me close by sharing with you one last analogy. If what we believe is the music and what we do is the dance, consider the honeybee for whom the dance is also a matter of life and death. When a honeybee discovers a source of food, it returns to the hive and reveals the location to the other bees through a complex series of movements called the waggle dance. The bees take note of the several variables within the dance but identify both direction and distance for the nectar and off they go carrying just enough food to make it to their destination. If one doesn't get the message right, it won't find the food in time. If you've ever seen a bee crawling on the ground, it probably has run out of energy in this very way and will soon die. In the same manner, Jesus entered this hive of humanity we call Earth, singing as in the music we just heard, a heavenly song, showing us through His dance, His life, the way back to God, to the paradise from which we have all fallen. And as Jesus often said during his time on earth, so he still says today, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen and obey, and like the honeybee who finds the food, you shall live. Don't listen, or listen and don't obey, and you shall surely die. What complicates things is that there's an enemy who has his own song to sing, a song of lies that would drown out the choruses of heaven. We have clearly seen this enemy in our examination of rock music. Truly, his song is sung in many other places as well. Thank God, however, that no matter how suffocating Satan's lies become, they are no match for the truth. For those of you who have ears to hear, surely you have heard. Now all that remains is the act of obedience, 
It's time to make that exchange. If you've never done it, turn from your sin. Tell God you're sorry. Receive the love and forgiveness that is His good pleasure to grant. If you're sincere, His grace will be poured into your life, and you'll have the power to change, to be a true child of God. I did this nine years ago, at the height of my own rock and roll days, and my life was eternally changed. I know it may be kind of scary, but God will do the same for you. I'm going to pray now to help those who may not know what to say to God. There's a million ways to say it. What matters most is the attitude of your heart. Are you truly willing to give everything over to God? Well, tell Him that. Pray this way. Dear God, my Father and my Redeemer, forgive me, Lord, for my sins, most of all for living my life the way I wanted to. I see now my rebellion, my pride, how I have rejected you and your love. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to suffer on my behalf, and I humbly and gratefully accept the exchange he made on the cross. I give you my sin, my life, my all, and receive from you your forgiveness and your offer to adopt me as one of your own children. Thank you for giving me a new heart. I declare before you, the devil and man, that from this day forth, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. As I have to leave you now, a final word of advice. If you still haven't established that relationship with God, please think hard about what you've just seen and heard. Pray and ask God to reveal the truth to you. Surely you can't be frightened of the truth. And if you did pray that prayer, tell someone about it. You can even contact us here at Real to Real. We would love to hear from you. Begin to pray. In other words, talk to God. Read the Bible and find a good church where people are sincerely living for God. Take care, and I'll see you in our Father's kingdom. For you are my God.
Thank you. 